we're turning into the text today to Matthew chapter number seven. Uh, we're going to uh, abbreviate our preaching today so we can kind of get in and out of your way. But this is, uh, I think uh, this week and next week, I'm going to bring back a series I preached several years ago called Stop Lying to Me. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how to be liar proof today uh, because there's a lot of lies running around in the world. And, uh, and, and some of us may need to be reminded that... Uh, we can be liar proof. Matthew chapter 7, verse number 15. Just by way of uh, by way of review, the book of Matthew is the gospel that is written, attributed to the apostle Matthew. He was Jewish. Uh, he was a tax collector, which just meant that uh, he was like an IRS agent during his time and a cheating one at that. Amen. So all of you who are cheating, finance, IRS type people, there's hope for you. Somebody say amen. <laughs> Jesus followers had a little bit of everybody in. He had some thugs, some, some roughnecks. Somebody say amen. Chopping people's ears off and doing all kind of things. There's, there's, there's hope for the roughnecks. He, he, he had some, some young teenagers, 17 years old, has thought that John was the youngest, a teenager following Jesus, so you ain't got to be an old person to follow Jesus. He had some fishermen, working class people, somebody say amen. He even had some sisters in his, in his, in his band, amen. So there's, there's just room for everybody. Somebody say everybody can fit in Jesus' squad. And so this particular gospel is written to the Jewish audience in mind. If you go through the book of Matthew, you will find a consistent appealing and reminding of the readers that Jesus is the promised Messiah. Even as being the promised Messiah, they had to also expand their understanding of what that meant. Because in the Jewish kind of concepts of Messiah, their narrow understanding, though, you know, okay, was that the Messiah would restore an earthly kingdom, restore uh, the, 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 the state of Israel, now I wouldn't say state, the nation of Israel to its own kind of, you know, prominence, if you will. And as Jesus went through the course of his life, Jesus started to uh, expand the notion of Messiah so much so that the religious and legal scholars of the day became uncomfortable with Jesus' efforts to expand their imagination about who Jesus is, was, and was here to do. I'm going to park right there and just say, how many of you can be honest that we have had to expand our imagination about who Jesus is, was, and what Jesus is here to do? Of course, we as followers of Jesus in the tradition that has been called, known, and embraced to be Christianity. We certainly believe that Jesus uh, came to save the world, to redeem the world. Jesus, a part of the, the, the eternal uh, Godhead Trinity's effort to redeem fall, we, we fallen creation and put us back in the right relationship with God. We, we embrace that. And we also know that there is a particular expression of what it means to embody that that can be lost upon a whole lot of people particularly in Western Christian society. Uh, depending on how you learn the faith, sometimes you're going to have a lot of work to dechurchify your faith, to uncouple our faith, to have an expansive imagination about what Jesus is here to do. And I want you to know, beloved, that we ought to be grateful that in every era of Christendom, last 2,000 years, there were faithful followers of Jesus who were pushing the church at every era mm -hmm. to expand the church's imagination yeah. about what Jesus is, what he is doing, and our role in that. You ought to be thankful because there are lots of expressions of Jesus in particular eras of the church that would not have a lot of us involved, included, or certainly in positions where we have access to God. Mm hmm Hello, somebody. So what all it means is say that, you know, 
Matthew's gospel was an effort to make sure that the Jewish readers understood that this is the one y'all been waiting for. Now take it for what it's worth. You can take it or leave it, but you, ought, you do not have to wait for another Messiah. You already have touched and held and heard and seen. And this particular uh, author, I think, did a masterful job in doing so. And so as we get here in Matthew chapter number seven, these uh, are part of Jesus' words. His most firm, famous sermon is called the Sermon on the Mount. So Matthew 6 through Matthew 9, Jesus is uh, attributed to, collect, to collecting uh, large numbers of folks, and Jesus would teach outside on a mountain with no PA system. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, when I thought about that for a second, Lord, my sermon may not be as short as I thought because I'm just, <laughs> I'm going to try to make it short. But I was thinking about this one day, because, you know, I've tried to speak at rallies, you know what I'm saying, and, and, you know, with no microphone, and after, like, the third chant, my voice just leaves. But it just made me think, man, Jesus must have had some kind of voice Amen. to be speaking on a mountain to thousands of people and not need a microphone. I mean, oh, Pastor Mike, there was no, like, you know, wasn't a lot of noise back then, you know. Didn't have cars, planes flying over. <laughs> Make all the excuses you want. I'm just telling you. Jesus had to be some kind of speaker to hold people's attention. Listen to this. For days at a time. I mean, the scriptures say many times Jesus had to send the people home. Y'all come back in the morning, and I'll give you part two. Like, what? They didn't come with no food. Jesus had to feed them some of the time. I mean, I want you to just think about how compelling of a speaker, the kinds of things that Jesus was saying that folk hadn't heard before. That they literally come out of their cities and be hanging out on a mountain in the hot sun. I've been to the Israel-Palestine region, and it's hot. I want you to know it's hot. It was hot when I went there. And you sitting out there baking in the sun, listening to a teacher speak for hours about the new thing God is doing. It does remind me that if you have a message, people will come to hear what you have to say. If you can speak truth to the parts of them that no one else is speaking. But the back story, the flip side of that is sometimes people can speak a nugget of truth and wrap it in a lie and in deception and in falsehood. And when you can't discern the truth, people give you sand and tell you it's water. And you'll drink it and never have your thirst quenched. That is the liar that I want us to be mindful of among us. And so Jesus speaking on and during the Sermon on the Mount speaks about false prophets. So here we go. It's Matthew 7, verse number 15. The scripture says, this is Jesus speaking, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people... Pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles. Likewise, every good tree, everybody say good tree, bears good fruit. Everybody say good fruit. Y'all didn't say it loud enough. Come on, let's say it again. Likewise, every good tree, somebody say good tree, bears good fruit. Everybody say good fruit. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. Lord, have mercy. And the bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree, somebody say every tree, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Verse 21, we'll keep on reading. Not everyone... This is important. Who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. 
Now this ought to send a shiver through every one of our spines. I want you to understand what I'm saying. You send a shiver through mine. Now I'm the preacher. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Mm. And in your name drove out demons, and in your name performed many miracles? This is Jesus talking to them now. So this, this ain't no hearsay telephone game. This is Jesus telling them. Listen, I will plainly say I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. This is why, they, this is why Jesus ended up on the cross. I just want y'all to understand me. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus ended up on the cross because he wasn't playing with these people. And they didn't like that. Therefore, listen, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise person who builds their house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house. Yes, yet it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish person who built their house on sand and the rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. And when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at Jesus' teaching because, listen, Jesus taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Again, another reason why Jesus ended up on a cross. Because I'm sure his uh, haters, enemies, didn't like that the people were listening to Jesus more than them. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. Oh, we're preaching from the topic today. I am liar proof. Let's pray. God bless the words that have been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide these words in our heart. So we will not sin against you. It's in the anointing and the power of the living God that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest on me and the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name, we pray that the people of God say amen. Uh, pat yourself on the chest. Say, I am liar proof. Come on, say that. I am. Now, uh, lying is a practice too often embraced situationally by many people we know. I'm not going to talk about you. I'm going to talk about the people you know. There are moments and times where we are willing to tell a story, a fib, uh, exaggeration, a lie, if you will, to preserve some folks' feeling, and perhaps maybe protect folks who may be vulnerable. Uh, someone say the ends may justify the mean. I looked up lying uh, as a pathological condition because I thought that it would be important to introduce some nuance into our conversation this morning when and as we talk about being liar proof. Because we live in a time where truth has particularly been trivialized. There are individuals who wake up every day and their number one goal is to send falsehood. Deception, dare I say lies, to our social media destination and have us believing things that are patently false and yet difficult for us to discern. And so this particular uh, exercise, I think I was looking up the Newton Institute, uh, and it was just a great Google, so you know, Google can be your friend, you know, and when you're just trying to find some information. But I also found that whatever you Google, you better cross-check it. 
with some folk that you know, trust, and believe. But I, I did like this list about the differentiation between a pathological liar and other types of liars. Now, this list is very interesting. Uh, it has two, four, five, it's five different kinds of liars. And I found myself in a couple of them. I felt a little bad. White liars, they tell untruths to protect others' feelings. I don't know why that's called a white lie, but you know, white liar or whatever, I don't know. Trying to make it less diabolical, I suppose. Y'all can de de decolonizing folks, Dr. Freeman, y'all can handle that on your own time. Occasional liar, lies at times to try to make themselves look good or get their needs met. Well, well, well. How many know sometimes you're socialized in your family or your, 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 your social location to feel like you have to lie to you know, get your, you know, when you fill out your taxes, you feel like, you know, I gotta lie to you know, keep a little money in my pocket. Or you, you're standing in the DMV line and you gotta, you know, man, I stood here for three hours and they called my number and you know, I, you know, I don't know, you just, you know, occasional things here and there, you know you te not telling the truth. It's just occasional. Just telling you what the categories are. No judgment. Habitual liar. Falling into a habit of lying because it feels easier or more convenient than telling the truth. A compulsive liar. They feel a high when they get away with lying. Similar to other compulsions or addictions. A prolific liar. See, there's levels to your lying. I mean, it's to lying. Not your lying. Your, your neighbor's lying. Of course, not yours. Mm -hmm. They lie frequently, but do not experience as much distress about lying or perceive as much danger as pathological liars. A white liar, an occasional liar, an habitual liar, a compulsive liar, a prolific liar. Now, when you go to the text, the text doesn't make a whole lot of distinctions between the white lie, the occasional lie, the habitual lie, the compulsive lie, or the prolific lie. But what I do believe the text tries to drive home, particularly if we are attempting to internalize what it means to follow Jesus well, is to balance the emphasis on the radical interpersonal impact of lies. And also the systemic and structural impact of lies. For be clear that liars individually that are in systems that perpetuate lies will rarely find dissonance within the lying structure itself. Which is just to say that if you are naturally given to lying, then you're not going to be morally upset when the institution you are a part of is lying. But for some of us, I hope that as we are involved in imperfect institutions, whether they be your family, your job, our government, your church, that when we find dissonance around what we hold to be true, we won't just go along with it because we're okay with a white lie an occasional, habitual, compulsive, prolific lie. Because be clear, beloved, uh, the scriptures give us admonitions about how liars will find their end. Mm-hmm. Proverbs 12, verse 19 says, truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue lasts only a moment. Forever versus a moment. You know what's so deep about a moment? You just don't know when it's gonna end. A moment could be today. A moment could be tomorrow. But the key to this is to understand that truth lasts. Lies have an expiration date. Proverbs 12 verse 22, the Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in people who are trustworthy. Proverbs 14, 5, an honest witness does not deceive, but a false witness pours out lies. 
Proverbs 19. I'm just giving you some scriptures to hang your hat on when someone asks you, is it all right to lie? Proverbs 19, 9, a false witness will not go unpunished, and whoever pours out lies will perish. Colossians 3, 9 through 10, do not lie to each other. Since you have taken off your old self with all its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of the creator. Uh, Luke 8, verse 17 says, for there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed. Nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. And this is one of my favorite passages when it talks about a liar. Jesus was talking to some of the folk who was self-righteous, making claims about their moral standing and connection to Father Abraham, if you will. And because they couldn't understand what Jesus was saying, Jesus flat out told them, he said, you are unable to hear me because you belong to your father, the devil. That's why I tell you they're full of the devil all the time. Mm -hmm. That's better than me cussing you out. That's, that's my way of letting you know that I'm not pleased with you. <laughs> Particularly these politicians and these wicked people. I say, you're just full of the devil. So I tell them, if I tell you full of the devil, you won't stand nice with Pastor Mike. But you, you know, the devil can come out of you, then you can be you know, back in good grace with Pastor Mike. Stop being wicked. Somebody say amen. You belong to the devil. You want to carry out your father's desires. The devil was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in the devil. When the devil lies, the devil speaks the devil's native language. For the devil is a liar and the father of lies. Mm -hmm. I don't know who Donald Trump is, but he definitely, he ain't the father. He got to be an uncle or a cousin or something. <laughs> Somebody say amen. Tell your neighbor, don't you be no cousin to the devil. <laughs> Lying at its core is about power, manipulation, deception, and control. It is a demonstration that you do not have enough trust. And whoever you are dealing with to handle the truth in a way that is responsible. Lying is a way to create a false reality that you know puts that person in a vulnerable state. It is a way to shield oneself from accountability. It is a scheme to ensure that we cannot be on the same page at the same time because you likely do not have the confidence that you could win, compete. Dare I say, maintain what power you think you have. How many know that for most of our lives, we've been lied to about a lot of things by a lot of people. And depending on what kind of liar you're dealing with, I do make space and room for those of us who, because of our trauma and our vulnerability, have been taught, trained, socialized that to tell the truth may create consequences you know you are not able to handle. If you are the son, the daughter, the child of substance abusers, you have been taught how to bend reality and truth in a household in order to maintain some level of false and temporary stability. If you've worked in a racist system, you've been socialized to not Tell the truth when you get injured or harmed because you know if I speak out, an ax is going to drop. If you are a woman, a queer person, someone who's directly impacted by systems, if you're too black, if you're too, too, too poor, you've been taught that the system is rigged against you in certain rooms and spaces. 
So you can't always show up as you want to. So you build these mechanisms to navigate. All of these things are true. And I want you to know, beloved, that part of our task as we follow Jesus is to begin to wrestle with how do we show up as God's purveyors of truth in systems, relationships, and places that thrive off lives. What does it mean for us to build the internal constitution of our spirit, of our soul, of our mind? So even when you're surrounded by lies, you can become liar proof. Which just means that, yes, I know that perfection is likely outside of my grasp when it comes to the foibles and the, the, the deeds and, 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 and the challenges I face. I, I, I'm not going to get it right all the time, but I'm not going to lose my conscience. I'm going to be somebody who is a Psalms 51 follower of Jesus, that when I mess up, I'm going to repent. I'm not going to double down. I'm going to say, create in me a clean heart. I'm going to open up space for me to be corrective and to be corrected. Because none of us know everything. At every moment in time, I've had to learn some things that I thought were true. Over life's journey, I realized, hmm, that was not as true as I understood it to be. And I will be honest that there are some moments in my life where things that I thought were true, the more I pulled on that string. Anybody ever had a, any, any people who, 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 who knit? No, who, who, who yeah, who sew? But well, how about that? Anybody ever had a loose string? And you, you, you know, you see this string, you know, it's a little, at, you know, a little, you just like, oh, you know, you try to tuck it, you know, just tuck it underneath there. Then it gets so long, it's like, okay, well, I'm going to take it off, and then you pull it, and your whole thing just zit, and then you're just walking around with a new style. <laughs> it's like, man, I, 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 bought, I bought it looking one way, and now I got a new style. How I many know some of us, our, 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 our worlds are held together? by strings and threads that are not powerful enough to hold the complexity of the garment you call life. That failure is not God, it's the seamstress. Hello, somebody. Whoever put it together for you. And the tradition that we have been handed sometimes requires some updates. It doesn't require us to throw it away. It requires some updates, some opportunities for us to learn anew that which we thought was settled. And beloved, I want you to know that this happens within the context of community. It must happen within the context of community or else we fall into the, 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 the risk of being overwhelmed with our own avarice, pride. Ego, because in as much as I know, I want to know that I know a lot of things. There are many things that I need community to help me discern. Becoming liar proof means that you have to be in a community committed to telling the truth. And I have found throughout the course of my life that not many people want to be a part of a truth-telling community. <laughs> they say the truth will set you free. But some of us don't want freedom. How many know that beautiful lies are harder to wrestle with than ugly truths? Beautiful lies, you know, oh, I, you know, love the lie to myself. Oh, this, 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 this puff, puff passing is not really making no impact in my life. This 
sip, sip, drunk, drunk, drinking. This fighting spirit I got. This, this cheating. It, 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 it's not that big of an impact. But beloved, I want you to know that too much of anything will erode the holy equilibrium God has created us with. I know some of us are so out of balance, we can't tell up from down. We can't tell truth from fiction. We are in such lying communities. Let me tell you what a lying community is. Fox News. CNN, MSNBC, a lot of these news agencies aren't committed to telling you the truth. They're committed to telling you what you want to hear according to someone else's ideological assumptions. So where can you find the truth? Well, you must find the truth, beloved, through a rigorous testing, this is my first point, of your sources. You become liar proof by number one, checking your sources. Jesus says it like this, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. Not everyone who claims to be the source of information is the source of truth. And the need for us to have multiple conversation partners committed to truth telling is critical in an age where we are often drawn to sources of truth that give us confirmation bias. You know what a confirmation bias is? When you are surrounded by people who agree with everything you think, and then it's like, I knew that was true. Like, you know, like when, you know, you had a 49er game and we winning until the fourth quarter. And then it's like, you know, everybody there is convinced of something that is not contested. I want you, beloved, to know that we at the way are people who really want to be committed to truth telling through the tradition that we have as followers of Jesus, through the experience of, 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 of saints, people who follow Jesus for a long time, because experience matters in the Pentecostal tradition. We're not just dogmatic fundamentalists where we just read a scripture translated into our English dialect and then we don't act as if your experiences don't inform how you read those texts. All of us are coming here with some knowledge, some experiences that inform. We also want to be people who aren't afraid of books, scholars, who are committed to the Christian tradition. We want to believe that there is knowledge that is knowable, right? And so all of this for us is an exercise in what I believe the biblical word would be used is discernment. How do I take all the information we have and we come to a discernible truth? When we don't check our sources and we take everything at face value, we are adopting someone else's process of discernment. And that process of discernment may not have your best intentions in mind. I won't go too long, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll mention this a little bit more next week, but I remember we were doing our COVID work. We were uh, uh, researching all the misinformation that was being proliferated on social media by people like uh, Riza Islam and, and some of our Nation of Islam friends and some of our other friends who were part of the, 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 uh, the uh, you know, the YouTube University scholars. You remember them folk? Everybody was saying, you know, that this wasn't real. The first of all, I thought it was real until you start dying. Two million people. Many of those deaths preventable. Right? Because, listen to this, 12 individuals responsible for over 70% of the misinformation on social media. 12. 
And we found out who they were. And I knew, you know, familiar with a couple of them. And, I, and, 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 and as, as we talked and read, some of them just had a certain ideological distrust with the system, but they were being swept up into propaganda. Some of these same kind of threads are now being promulgated during this election season. It is so difficult to see some of my brothers who are caught in these webs of lies and misrepresentations and misogyny, and particularly as it relates to VP Kamala Harris. I can understand if you don't like her policies, although most people don't describe what they don't like. They're being fed talking points by some right-wingers. Now, there's some policies about the Biden administration of which she's a part of I don't like. I deplore the policy and the application of our foreign policy in Palestine. I deplore it. But you want to know what's interesting? Someone got in my mentions the other day. I can just do a quick detour. And told me that I was responsible for children burning because of another wicked attack by the IDF and the Israeli government. And they said I was responsible. Me, Pastor Mike, because they saw me in a picture with VP Harris. Now, you know, there's moments where I don't be feeling like I got time for people, but I had time that day. And you know, I, I just reminded them that there has never been an election I voted in where I felt like their foreign policy was righteous. Not one. I learned about the Rwanda genocide while I was in seminary. And how our country and many countries sat by when one million Rwandans were killed in 100 days. No one lifted a finger to stop it. Clinton didn't stop it. I was a voter when George Bush lied about weapons of mass destruction and literally massacred millions of Arab people in the Middle East on a lie. And the only woman who did not vote against it, vote for it, was Barbara Lee, our Congresswoman. But every other politician voted to support a genocide. I voted when Barack Obama dropped more drones, bombs in Africa. And now I'm alive to watch our administration do more wickedness in our name. And so my challenge to everybody who's feeling like, you know, this is the most wicked thing our country's ever done. Welcome to the party of outrage about our country's foreign policy that overthrows governments, that funds genocides, that kills heads of states in our name. I told my beloved, with all due respect, just please keep the same energy. When the algorithms push this story off of your page. Because for many of us, to follow Jesus in a warmongering nation means that we must cry aloud and spare not all the time. And hold people accountable all the time. And figure out ways to subvert this system of imperialism that still through our tax dollars wrecks havoc across the world and maybe ask ourselves more questions about our complicity in Haiti and Congo and the Sudan and Tigray. You know, during, during COVID, there was a genocide in Tigray. Members of our church had family members trapped in the Sudan in a desert because they got pushed out of Tigray because of a genocide that was happening. And so our foreign policy, beloved, must now become something that we advocate for beyond yes. a presidential election. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
What does it mean to now restart an anti-war movement led by God's people? To ensure we're not dropping bombs and we're not stealing the resources of, of mineral rich nations so we can have iPhones and Apple watches. Mm -hmm. She didn't come back to my mentions after that. Only because there's no perfect place to do righteousness. So that is why the scripture says what? To love mercy, do justice. And what's the last part? Walk humbly. Humbly. Don't be self-righteous in your attempts to do justice. Offer an invitation. Our people need our voices all across the world. We need to speak up about what's happening in Palestine and in the foreign policies. But how many of you know we also need you to speak up about what's happening at home? How we have poverty in the wealthiest region of the world. And it is preventable poverty. We have more empty houses in the Bay Area than we have unhoused people. That is a failure of governance and policy. We have all kinds of systemic and structural wickedness. And we love to believe a beautiful lie. Oh, they lazy. Oh, Pookie, he just no, he go get a job. Oh, they just don't want to work. You got to become liar proof. Because none of those things are the reasons why we have this wickedness of violence and poverty among us. It is because we have lies that are comfortable for us. To embrace, because it makes us feel good. Oh, well, if they just lazy, guess what? That means I ain't got to really do nothing for them. That's their problem. Go get a job. Go to school. Go work. I'm not saying that folks don't need to do all that, but how many of you know that there's other parts of the story that you got to check? You ought to talk to a homeless, unhoused advocate before you come to a conclusion about Policies to address the unhoused. You ought to talk to a formerly incarcerated, systems impacted person and family. You ought to talk to some queer people. You ought to talk to some women. You ought to talk to some young people. You ought to talk to some fellas. You ought to talk to some family. Talk to folk before you become too fundamentalist in your arrival at a solution to a problem that you only hear one voice telling you about it. And the challenge for many of us is we like to hear the one voice who lies to us because a lot of us don't mind a beautiful lie. But I'm here to tell you, beloved, that you ought to check your sources. Somebody holler, check my sources. The second thing the scripture says is that by your fruit will you know who these people are. I believe you got to listen to people's actions, not just their words. Uh, somebody holler, your actions speak louder than your words. How is it that someone who claims to, to, to love God but hate the people God created? How is it you can say that you love the world but you hate creation? How is it that you can believe, beloved, that, 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 that you know, uh, someone uh, running for a certain political office says that, you know, they got your back, but then they unleash in the very systems to punish you and I? When we don't fit into their narrow vision of the world. I don't care what people say with their mouth. I want to know, what will you do? In the words of one of our greatest Bay Area prophets, Marshawn Lynch, <laughs> said it very succinctly. I'm about that action, boss. Keep your words. Show me with your actions. Because talk is cheap. Particularly when you don't have no investment of your deeds, of your money, 
of your own values. Here's some questions. How can we be more about the action and less about the rhetoric? What kind of contradictions do you see at work between the talkers and the doers? Becoming liar proof means that I will align through the power of God's spirit, the truth with my actions. If I am a peacemaker, then I must be a person of peace. Let me say it differently. If I believe in peace, then I must be a person of peace. It's risky to be a peacemaker in a world of war. When you've been told, lied to that, to be a peacemaker means you weak, you a sucker, you a buster. To turn the other cheek means that you just going to be killed and shot. And Listen, beloved, being a peacemaker just means that you will find ways among violent conditions to carve out resolutions that do not create more violence. It means you will not use tools of violence to accomplish the aims of peace. And if you and I who follow the Prince of Peace cannot find ways to create peace without violence, then you and I are more aligned with the father of lies than we are the Prince of Peace. It's a rough word for the Western American empire who claims to be Christian but has no problem being violent, has no problem owning guns, has no problem uh, uh, dropping bombs on people and then praying about it. What, who are you praying to when you drop a bomb on somebody and feel like whoever you praying to told you that was okay? Uh, I don't think you're talking to the Prince of Peace. You must be talking to the Father of Lies. And all of us need to ask ourselves, God, how can I be more peaceful in my personal interactions? Because God, I don't believe God will tell you to knock somebody's head off. You ought to be honest. When you got a temper, when, you, when you're a violent person, the scripture says... Lord, deliver me from a violent person. I don't think, the, I don't think that the, the prayer was to the person outside of them. This is not my father. Didn't, my father told us that, certain, that verse when we were young because my dad told us the three things, brothers, talking to me and my brothers, that you're going to have to deal with. The love of money, the love of women, and violence. My dad told us when we was little boys. You don't, you, don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't get all this under control, you're going to be messed up. My daddy said, yeah, we, you make bride men, we, we, we have tempers. And my, my grandfather, this is my dad talking to us, my grandfather was a violent man. And so we heard my, 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 our people walk around in North Carolina saying, Lord, deliver me from a violent man. And it wasn't talking about the person outside of them. Wow. Speaking to themselves. How many know the word of God sometimes you have to preach it to yourself? Yeah. We want to preach to everybody else, control everybody else's behaviors. How about controlling your own? Can you imagine if every Christian asked God to deliver them from the violent person inside of them? Can you imagine if every follower of Jesus asked God to deliver them from their lying tongue? Can you imagine what kind of church we would be if every follower of Jesus asked God to make sure that we did not harbor hatred in our heart towards people we don't know, agree with, or like? Do you realize we wouldn't have most of the problems we have in the Christian society? <laughs> I tell it like this. If every Christian committed not to kill another Christian, we wouldn't have wars in the world. I'm not talking about killing another Muslim. I'm not talking about killing another Buddhist. I'm talking killing. I'm saying if every Christian, everyone who claims to follow Jesus, made a commitment not to kill another one who claims to follow Jesus, we will not have wars. What does that say about the failure of some of our Christian preaching and? T- 
teaching and formation that we can't even not kill one another. It's a tough word. It was tough for me. It's going to be tough for you too. But I believe that loving the truth, rejecting liars, opens up space for God's power to be manifest. And this is who I want us to be as a church. I want us to be people when they see followers of the way coming. They say, man, them some truth-telling people. Them for folk, they not going to be, be uh, uh, invested in wars and violence and racism and mendacity and, 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 and propping up uh, uh, false uh, hoods and, 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 and unleashing hell on people. These are some folks, whenever we see a follower, whenever you have on our T-shirt, They're going to understand. That's a liar-proof individual right there. I can't speak for nobody else's church, but I sure enough hope I can speak for ours. We want to form people in ways where no matter what room you're in, you could be in the classroom, you could be in the the, the, the White House, you could be in the mayor's office, you could be in, 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 on the street corner, you could be in the counselor's office, you can be wherever you are that you are someone who's liar proof. I will not be caught up in the falsehoods of this era. Jesus said, I buy the truth and do not sell it. Don't be a sellout, beloved. But let's be liar proof. Come on, stand with us, everyone, as we prepare to pray. Next Sunday, part two. Stop lying to me. That's what I'll talk about next Sunday. Because I didn't get to it today. But how many know some of us have internalized some lies about our own selves? We've internalized lies about who you can be who you've been created to be. You've internalized lies about your self-worth, about your purpose. You've internalized lies from past relationships, current relationships, your boss, your antagonist, your homie, your friend, the culture. So some of us have to also interrogate what are the things that I've been told about myself that I must reject in order to become liar proof. I believe all of us are fearfully and wonderfully made. Being fearfully and wonderfully made don't mean that you are perfect. It means God's created you with all of your essence. God looked at that and said, man, that's some good stuff. In your essence, God didn't be like, oh, I'm creating you with some defects and it ain't. Even the way we describe folks who may not have the, the, the same levels of, of agency bodily or mentally or whatever, I believe that God still finds them fearfully and wonderfully made. We just live in a society that don't make room for people. And so we diminish one another, but I will not diminish you. You ought to tell your neighbor, I will not diminish you. I will not make you smaller so I can feel bigger. But I'm going to create room for us. Because God creates us all fearfully and wonderfully made. Grab the hand of someone next to you. God bless the hand that I'm holding today. Give strength, give peace, give power, give hope to them, give love to them, build within them the guardrails, the boundaries, the nuance, the discernment to be liar proof today. Make they be people, God, who are able to understand the depths, the impacts of lies and untruths told by those at the highest levels of our society and even those that are told within our own families and our own neighborhoods. God, may they be liar proof. May they not be seduced and swayed 
by the untruths that are trafficked in their workplace, in their family, in their community, but with love and humility and gentleness and compassion, may we, God, reject lies and embrace truth. Embrace a more perfect way. Embrace, God, a wide-ranging panoply of sources that get us closer to a full expression of what is true. And this is what we know to be true, God, that you love us and that we love you and that the hand I'm touching and holding is loved by both you and us. So God, I pray that love will overwhelm them and overtake them. And I pray, God, that discernment will well up within them so they can be liar proof. Now lift your hands where you're standing. It's me, God. I stand in the need of prayer. It is not my mother, it is not my father, my sister, nor my brother, but it's me, oh Lord, and I need you, God. I need you to visit my heart, visit my mind, visit my spirit. Teach me your ways, oh God. Show me the way I must go. Heal me from all the hurt and the harm that life has brought my way. Reveal to me my purpose. Help me to understand that my steps can be ordered by you. And I pray today, God, that every wicked imagination, every scheme, every manipulation that comes from the enemy, God, may it be defeated right before our eyes. Lord, those who mean us harm, may they fall to the wayside. Those who you brought in to be angels and helpers, God, may they emerge and arise. And God, if no one is there, may you always be felt near to me. Lord, surround me with mercy. Surround me with grace. Surround me with love. And above all, God, surround me with salvation. Somebody say, save me, Lord. Come on, say it again. Save me, Lord. Come on, say it again. Save me, Lord. Keep me. Hold me. Strengthen me. Love me, God so I can face this hour with confidence knowing that you are with me your rod and your staff they comfort me you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies my cup runs over with your anointing and your favor and I know it is done in Jesus name we pray come on hug two or three people tell them I am liar proof today Come on, tell them that I'm liar proof. Tell them you're liar proof. Go on and be a liar proof follower of Jesus this week.